And so the thing uh, for that exercise, if you will, what I've encouraged everybody to do is just to try to read through James as one entire letter, as it would have been read when it was written back in the first century, to see it in its entirety, because sometimes we'll take a verse and we'll read it outside of its context, its passage, things like that. And so by reading it in its entirety and trying to figure out, okay, how is this sort of structured? Like he's got his opening, he's talking about wisdom, he's talking about controlling your tongue. And so outlining it allows you to break down the letter and sort of see how it sort of fits together structure-wise. And so how I broke mine down was, and again, with outlines, there's no right or wrong way per se. Uh, I had it broken down in six parts. You can definitely use a lot of sub-bullets. But first part with the first 18 verses was opportunities and trials and temptations. Then I looked at principles and trials and temptations. Then I looked at active faith in relationships active faith in humility, active faith in waiting, and then active faith in holiness. And so as you can tell, how I want to take this series is I want to look at it from active faith, living in active faith in the midst of trials and temptations. Now, whenever you go to a book study on the book of James, you'll find most of the time it's dealing with overcoming trials, having joy in trials, stuff like that. I really want to zero in and focus on chapter two of living in active faith faith. And so that's really what we're going to be looking at. And book of James is really unique, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But before we get into the book of James and the first verse, I want to bring up what's called foundational hermeneutics. I actually do need my glasses because there's not a lot of light up here. So Oscar can somehow control the lights on the camera and make this brighter, but it feels like I'm in a shadow, so I need to have my glasses on. But I really want to get into what I call foundational hermeneutics. Basically, Hermeneutics is just the term used for interpreting or understanding a body of literature. Most people don't realize this, but people use the principles of hermeneutics almost every day. When you're reading instructions, whether you're reading a letter, you're trying to interpret what you're reading. And there's certain principles like uh, using the verses, the sentences literally, unless the context dictates otherwise. And so you want to read everything literally unless it's clear that an analogy, a metaphor, stuff like that is supposed to be used. So hermeneutics is just really trying to interpret it. Now when you get into hermeneutics, and when I was going through seminary, uh, this is just one of many books that I had the joys of reading and going through and studying. There's a lot of different aspects of interpretation, whether it's literary context, when you're looking at the genres, historical, the grammatical, the Bible context, book. There's so many contexts that hermeneutics actually teaches what to look at, what to zone in on, and how do we best interpret scripture. Now, we don't necessarily need to have this book to go ahead and understand what God is writing because many people in the whole world don't have... Uh, books on interpretation or hermeneutics, let alone may have a Bible on their persons. And so the Bible in itself is sufficient to understand and interpret itself. But when we apply the principles of hermeneutics, it simply allows us to gain a fuller, greater understanding of Scripture, the interpretation, and then how to best interpret it in our lives today. So if anybody's interested, I have a couple in, uh, hermeneutic books over here. You'd be welcome to borrow them, take a look at them, and uh, see what you think about them. So basically, when it comes to hermeneutics, foundational hermeneutics, what I'm really talking about is what are the basics of interpretation. What is the clear basics of understanding it? And basically that's where this handout comes into play. Now I guess I gave everybody a handout but myself. And so so basically anybody following on Facebook, I think I emailed them out as well. This is actually an excerpt from one of my favorite hermeneutic classes that I've taken. I've had to take like four or five of them, I want to say, while I was doing my bachelor's and master's. And I don't have this book. I loaned it. And you know how things go when you loan books out. Well, you don't get them back typically. And so this was by, uh, it was called Grasping God's Word. And it was by uh, Scott Duvall and Hayes. Hayes was the last name, I believe, as well. And this handout was in the book. And this was the clearest I've ever seen as far as how to properly interpret or hermeneutic the Bible. And so I just want to look at this briefly. And if we can understand this, this is the foundations of hermeneutics. What is the bare minimum to try to understand to properly interpret this to gain proper clarity? 
And so on the first, obviously there's a picture of these two cities with a river and a bridge. Basically what uh, they're illustrating here is the left side is the culture in the city of the day of which it was written. On the right side, it's our current day, the contemporary time. There's a language that separates the two areas, and then there's a bridge that connects them both together. And so the first step in interpreting is grasping the text in their town. Basically, what we want to look at and what we want to try to understand is, what did it mean to them then? That's the first question we need to ask. Because we've got to realize that out of these 66 letters, they were written by specific people to specific people or a specific audience going through a specific circumstance. And so while God's word is transcendent, it was also written during a period of time of history. And so while it was written maybe 2,000, 3,000 years ago, it still has relevance in our life today. And so what we should try to do is find out what did it mean to them then? And we're going to look at that tonight with the book of James. After that, if you flip over to the back side, and I printed it like this specifically for Oscar, so hopefully he's following along with him. And if Oscar realizes uh, by camera, I printed y'all's head to foot, but I printed mine the civilian way. So I did that just for you, Oscar. So next week, uh, we'll be back to your old ways. So the second step, once we figure out what did it mean to them then, we want to figure out what he says, the width of the river. Understand that in their day, there were some differences to our days today. For instance, if, I, if you're writing to the Jewish people in the first century, there's some differences. They're living under a different government. There's a totally different culture. There's a different language. The words are used differently. And then when you get in the Old Testament, now you're under a different covenant. You're under the law, the Mosaic covenant, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're right, exactly, and it applies today, and that's where hermeneutics, these principles are more than really just scripture itself. They apply everywhere, and like I said, we don't realize it, but we hermeneutic a lot, you know, throughout our day. And so what we want to do is we want to see what are the differences between their time and ours today. If we're reading the Old Testament, we know we're under grace and not under law, then we know that, okay, if there's anything that's law-binding, that was a totally different covenant. That's not for us today. And then if we're reading in the Old Testament, and it was specifically written to Israel, and those blessings are specifically to Israel, and the judgments are specifically to Israel, they're not for the church today. They're still for Israel. And so we've got to understand the differences. Then in the third step, we're understanding what it meant to them then. What are the differences? We find out, okay, what is the main point God is trying to get across in this passage, in this book, in this letter, whatever the case is. And then from there, you're going to have one main principle or one main thought idea that God has. And while you've probably heard it said there's one interpretation because God was specifically writing to a specifically specific group of people at a specific time, there's one proper interpretation, but there could be various applications of the passage. So we've got to figure out what is God trying to get through to them then? That's crossing that bridge. Step four, how does it fit within the rest of Scripture? So when we're looking at context, you have your immediate context, your surrounding context, the passage. You have your book context. It's got to fit within the context of the book, like the book of James. Then you have what's called the Bible context, which is how does this fit within the framework of the entire Bible? This is where studying doctrines, Christology, homartiology, angelology, things like that are important because we get this bird's eye view of this theology so that we're understanding James and we're reading chapter 2 and it seems like James is saying well if you're not working you're not a genuine Christian but when we look at other passages like Ephesians 2 or Romans 4 that says that you're saved strictly by grace through faith and John 3 16 for God so loved the word he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would have everlasting life when we understand that we can understand through the Bible context the James 2 isn't saying that if you don't work, you're not a genuine Christian. So that's what he's talking about there. What principle are we pulling out of the passage? How does it fit with the Bible context, if you will? And then the last step, grasping it in our town today. Once we figure out what it meant to them then, once we figured out what the main principle is, how it applies to us today. And there are similar things that we can share with the people of God back then that we're going through today. So 
I could spend like five, six weeks on this. I just wanted to cover this from a surface level. I encourage you to look through this. And when you're going through your own Bible studies, go ahead and consult this and write on it, whatever the case is. Feel free to go ahead and, and uh, see how that journey takes you. And so hopefully that's a blessing for you. Within foundational hermeneutics, we have to understand that everybody has presuppositions. A presupposition is just an idea or a thought you hold on to that you've always carried or you've adopted for a long time. But the problem happens when we come to certain books of the Bible, like James, for instance, our presupposition dictates how we understand the Scripture. And so what we end up doing is doing what's called eisegesis. Eisegesis simply means to insert into the text, whereas exegesis means you're taking out of the text. And so to make it simple is exegesis is good, eisegesis is bad. And so I have a note, and I have free copies to all this from Investigating Lordship Salvation, Why I have an excerpt like this. It says, I have heard it said that eisegesis requires mental maneuvering and theological gymnastics, and with this I unequivocally agree. Though I would say there are few Christians who abuse God's word for personal gain, Many do misunderstand God's word due to presuppositions they carry and an unwillingness to challenge one's own belief. Case in point, when we get to James chapter 2 here in a couple weeks, we'll get to that, the verse where it says, faith without works is dead. And there are so many people within the reformed persuasion that will argue right there, James chapter 2 verse 14 says, what is a prophet? If a man say he has faith but he doesn't have works, can faith save him? So I see, you need to have works in order to be a genuine Christian. But what we'll see through studying this book is that's not at all what James is talking about from a spiritual sense. But there are some of the Reformed persuasion that have this presupposition theology-wise saying you have to persevere, you have to do this. Otherwise, you're not genuine. And therefore, they're inserting that thought into James chapter 2. So the reason why I wanted to do James chapter 2 is because this is a very clear case of not coming to Scripture contextually and performing eisegesis instead of exegesis. It's very difficult for these people whenever, even myself included, when we have these presuppositions and we have this thought we've carried for years and now someone's changing our, trying to change our view on something. Consider this. How many people have seen or their kids have seen the movie Land Before Time? Cartoon. Pretty, pretty cute movie, right? Exactly. Which one? Like the 28 of them. <laughs> they are cute, you know? But I use that as an example because consider this. Our children grow up watching Land Before Time, right? Cute animals, dinosaurs, whatever, you know, 70 million years ago, blah, 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 blah. They watch the movie growing up. They go to public school. They eventually get taught evolution right? So they have 12 years of public education. They grew up watching Land Before Time and cartoons like that. Then maybe they go to college. They go to a secular university and now they're enforcing evolution more and more and more. So say they have 12, 13, 14 years of public education teaching and promoting evolution. 4.6 billion years ago the earth was formed. 13 billion years ago the universe came into existence from point of singularity. Then a crazy Yahoo like me comes up and says, no, the earth is 6,000 years old. The earth is actually young. We can see this according to scripture. And evolution is a farce. No, God has specifically created mankind and animals and everything else. This person had went through 14, 16 years of public education by people they believe, you know, were very educated. and would never lie to them. So they have the presupposition that evolution is true. The earth is 4 billion years old and all these other things. We share a common ancestor with apes. They don't teach that we come from apes. They, sh they teach that we share a common ancestor. There's a big difference. But how hard would it be for that person in 14 years of public education to leave their thoughts and views of evolution to cling on to creationism? Probably very difficult, you know? And so what we have to realize when we come to Scripture is we have to lay our presuppositions aside and let Scripture speak for itself. And by doing interpretation or hermeneutics, using the foundations of it to try to understand what did it mean then and how does it apply to us today, we can prevent ourselves from holding on to our presuppositions and adding that into the text as opposed to letting the text speak for itself. Does that make sense? Well, 
yes, I mean, that would be a perfect example whether you got gap theory, pro progressive creationism, old earth, and theistic evolution. Because there, again, you're coming with, it, it, it's like looking at fossils in the ground. Everybody comes to fossils from two different points. One comes from fossils with the idea of evolution. One comes to fossils with creationism, you know. And so from there, you automatically start with different dating. And so if someone does hold to an evolutionary view, then yes, that's where some theologies can be put in. Like Hugh Ross is a perfect example. I think he's a Christian. I think he's very knowledgeable and smart, but he believes uh, in evolution. You know, it's because he's holding so much into his presupposition that evolution is true, and he's putting it in here to teach theistic evolution. That God just created evolution, stepped back, and let it run its course. He still attributes it to God, but he says God used evolution because all the science points to evolution. Although they're finding gears and clocks fossilized, now they're having to rethink how long fossilization works and blood cells and soft tissue and all this other stuff. So science always changes. Through the years, science always changes. This doesn't ever change, you know? And so, but yeah, that's a perfect, clear example as far as eisegesis. And so... Enough about, about that in interpretation. So just basically, there may be some of us that have read through the book of James, come to some chapters and verses and thought it's one thing, but my desire going through this study is that we can see it in its context and clearly see there is nothing of spiritual doctrine or theology in this letter. This is an entire letter of practical Christian living. And we're going to see that. But... I like what Warren Wiersbe says. Anytime, and if you've been in our class doing a book study, like when we did Malachi, anytime we start a Bible study, we always got to figure out the backgrounds of it. We got to look at author, audience, location, time, culture, things like that. I like what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, beginning a Bible book study is like preparing for a trip overseas. You'd like to know where you're going, what the weather and what the culture's like, what to expect, and what you want to get out of the trip. Determining all that beforehand will enlighten the trip much more, and you'll know what to expect before you arrive. And so I, I think that's a really good analogy. Again, you don't need to know all these things to understand Philippians 4.13 doesn't mean you can do anything because Jesus gives you the strength. You can understand that passage clearly by just simply reading the context, that no matter what situation you're in, you can handle it because it's Jesus that gives you the strength. But when you understand the background, the culture, the context, it just makes the Bible so much more alive and living for you. And so that's what I encourage through hermeneutics and those handouts that everybody can go ahead and, and grasp from grasping God's word. So, all right, so let's get into really uh, what is the book of James? The only other thing before we get into the first verse is when we look at what different books are, we want to look at what genre books of the Bible are. Now, there are different genres. You have poetry, which the book of Psalms is a poetical book. There's a lot of imagery, a lot of symbolism within it. Uh, you have books of wisdom, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Those are wisdom books. They're short, to the point, just snippets of wisdom, if you will, truth nuggets. Then you have narratives. Narratives, the book of Acts, the Exodus, and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Those are narratives. When we come to the book of James, we come to it as what's known as an epistle. An epistle is simply a letter or a message that was given to a particular audience. Now, when you're looking at epistles, you've probably heard that there are different types of epistles. You have what's known as the prison epistles. They're called the prison epistles because the apostle Paul had written them while he was in prison, Roman house arrest. And so those are Philippians or Colossians and I believe Ephesians and Philemon. Then you have what's known as the pastoral epistles. These are ones where Paul specifically writes to a pastor, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the book of Titus. Then you have what's known of as general epistles. And this is what most people put the book of James, a general epistle. The big difference between a general epistle and a pastoral prisoner, or whatever the case is, is general epistles typically are not addressed to specific individuals or a specific church. They're written for a general universal Christian audience. And so there are a few different general epistles, if you will. For instance, you have a, a book of Hebrews. You have 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and I believe the book of Jude as well, 1 John and 2 John. So those, no specific audience, they're just written to a general. 
Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum points out one other category of epistles. He calls them Messianic Jewish epistles or Jewish Messianic epistles. And basically, and this helps shed a little bit of light on it for me as well. When you're looking at a Jewish Messianic epistle, it's epistles or letters that were written strictly to a Jewish audience with a Jewish theme. And he would put James in that Messianic Jewish epistle as we're going to see tonight. What also makes up that collection is the book of Hebrews, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude. And that's how he would classify Messianic Jewish epistles. But, well, those would be Jews that are saved, believe in Messiah, is Jesus Christ, yes. Yep. And so that's what he would point out. All that to get to the first verse. And tonight, if you know anything about me, we're just going to cover one verse in the introduction because there's a lot to unpack, believe it or not. A lot of times we'll get to the openings or the introductions or even the closings, and we'll just sort of skim over it and breeze through it, sort of like we're reading the genealogy in Genesis and the book of Numbers and numbering all the tribes, when in reality there's so much depth and information in there. And that's what I want to reveal tonight. So tonight, James chapter 1, verse number 1. God records, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So, first thing we want to look at is the fact of the author. In the introduction, you'll typically find out a couple of things. Who the author is, who the audience is, what the location is, and you can somehow figure out the dating of the letter as well. We're going to look at those. Understanding the audience is critical to understanding the passages within the book. Because if we understand that uh, James is writing clearly to believers and believers alone, and if we have this Bible theology that once we get saved and we trust in Jesus as our Savior, that we're eternally as secure. If we see James is writing to Christians and we know that to be the truth, that we're eternally secure, then anything that James writes that makes us think, hey, I might lose my salvation, that's not accurate interpretation. So understanding the audience is very important to understand the passage and the verses. So the first thing, James. Now I got a question, which James? We're going to talk about it. Yep. Yep. We're going to get all to that. We're going to get all to that. So there are at least four different Jameses it could be. Uh, we're going to talk about three of them real quick. So one could be an apostle. He's otherwise known as James the Less. He's known as James the son of Alphaeus. And so this isn't the apostle Peter, James, and John, if you will. This is a different James within the 12 apostles. He's referenced in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 3. That's pretty much all we know about this James. We don't know a whole lot about this James of the apostle in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 3. James the less, if you will. Because of that, and because no church, early church, ascribes this letter to James the less, if you will, most people will say he, he's most likely not the author. So we probably make it, mark him off the list. The next James is... The Apostle James, otherwise known as James the Great, and this would be the one in the inner core, Peter, James, and John. And so this would be one of the sons of Zebedee. He would have been mentioned in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 21, in other passages. He had more of a, I don't want to say prominence, but that's probably a clearer word to understand than James the Less. There was more written and recorded of him than James the Less. So it's possible it could have been him. The only problem of it being him is he was beheaded, he was martyred by King Agrippa in Acts chapter 12. So he was martyred early into the church history, and it's believed that martyrdom happened around 42 AD. And so unless you take a very early date, which we'll talk about to the book of James, James the Great probably isn't the author of this letter. Now I could be wrong, but just looking at what we're deducing he's probably not it that leads us to the third James any idea who this other James is the half brother of Jesus now this is the third option now we know that this is the half brother of Jesus Galatians chapter 1 verse number 19 Paul clearly refers to James the brother of the Lord if you will 
this is the most probable author of this letter for a couple reasons. Number one, when you get as far back as the third century, you have some early church fathers that ascribe this letter to that particular James. Now, we can't get much farther back than the third century, third or fourth century. We don't have first century uh, auth- you know, belief in authorship for this particular letter. But going that far back, early tradition is this James. The second thought and why it's probable him is because he was a very influential person in the early church. Realize, this James, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, when Paul got saved, after his time in Arabia, Paul had a strong desire to see this James, the half-brother of Jesus. He said, I desired to see him. In the Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council, when they had to figure out all these Gentiles are coming into the Christian faith or the Jewish Christian faith, what are we going to do about the keeping traditions and the laws? There was discussion. James was the leading voice in that to say this is what we'll do. And that's in Acts chapter 15, there's 13 through 21. Another way we can tell he was a very influential leader in the Christian church is because in Galatians chapter 2, when there's a decision on appointing a missionary partner for Paul, it was James that had more or less assigned Barnabas to Paul. And Paul records that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. So this James was very influential in that first century church. It's actually quite amazing because a decade or so earlier, he was a critic of Jesus and his Messiahship. John chapter 7, verse 4 and 5 For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then you read in Mark chapter 6, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph and Judah and Simon? Are not these his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, king, and in his own house. Early on during Jesus' earthly ministry, from what we can tell in Scripture, his siblings did not believe in his Messiahship, James to be included. Something changed for James. The resurrection. That's why when you look at a lot of people's top ten reasons why I believe in God, believe in Christianity, believe in the resurrection, is because... James is one of the two people that are mainly referenced as far as their dramatic conversions. What would it take for you to believe your brother was God? A physical resurrection, maybe? And remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we recall Paul writing that after Jesus rose, he saw the masses, and he specifically went and saw James as well. And so the resurrection completely changed him. This James, we can read in, from the writings of Josephus and Hegesippus, which was a second century early church father, that James, who would have known whether Jesus Christ did physically rise or not, the story goes, what Hegesippus and Josephus writes, is that uh, there is this one priest that commanded him to renounce his faith and said, I want you to go to the temple walls in Jerusalem and renounce your faith. James was like, okay, okay, I'll go. So he goes up to the temple walls, and instead of renouncing his faith, he preached a sermon. They got mad, they pushed him over the walls of Jerusalem, and then they stoned him to death. According to what we understand from history, if that's factual, this James gave his life for something if he knew to be fabricated and a lie, he could have spared his life there, but he didn't. Again, the big difference between the Muslims that die for their religion and these early apostles is the Muslims are dying for a belief. These apostles are dying because of what they saw and they knew to be true. James put aside all his presuppositions on what he thought about Messiah, what he thought about his half-brother, and he came to saving faith. James is a perfect example of God's grace, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness. Realize the closest people to you, your blood relatives, well you know, if you will, completely ignore you, reject you, deny you. Even at one point in the Gospels, it's referred to the fact that they said he was actually insane. 
after all these decades of being a critic of Jesus, Jesus still offered him forgiveness. That just means it doesn't matter how far somebody goes, it doesn't matter how long they reject the blood of Christ, unless they take their last breath, there's still hope for salvation. James is a perfect example of God's grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Let us never forget that. Back to the text. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to realize what James doesn't say. What doesn't James say? He doesn't say, James, a kin of Jesus. He doesn't say, James, a brother of Jesus. He doesn't say, I'm James, the brother of the Messiah. He doesn't say, I'm James, the brother of the Lord. I'm James, the brother of God. I'm James, the brother of the Savior. Realize what he doesn't say. Realize what he does say. James, a servant of God and of the Lord, Jesus Christ. He doesn't associate him necessarily here with being the half-brother of Jesus. He refers to Jesus as his Lord and the Christ, or in other words, the anointed, the Messiah. James was dramatically converted. And he didn't try to put himself alongside of the Messiah, saying, hey, that was my, I grew up with him. We played soccer in Jerusalem. This was great. He didn't do that. He said, I recognize the lordship of Jesus. Regardless of if I grew up with him or not, he's my lord. He's my king. And I'm placing myself underneath him as a servant. If anybody within Jesus' family had an ability to be high and mighty and prideful, eh, it could have been Mary, and you see it wasn't her. It could have been James as well. I grew up with him. I know everything you don't know about him. But he rejects all that, at least in this letter that we read. And he says, I'm a servant, not of my brother. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. That's powerful. Do you think that James spent time going through his life when he got converted, that he reflected back, man, I just, I rejected him for 20, 30 years. Do you think James had an internal struggle with how much he kicked himself for not believing in Jesus? You see, it's so easy to ask for forgiveness of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, we read, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's easy if we just come to God with a broken heart and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. But it's so hard to forgive ourselves, isn't it? And that's the problem. James probably no doubt had the same issue internally of having to forgive himself for rejecting the Messiah. He could have learned so much. But there came a point in James's life where he had to have forgiven himself because we see that he's such an influential leader in the church in Jerusalem. He had to have forgiven himself. And this is what I want us to understand. Satan seeks to hold us under the bondage of this guilt. But unless we can forgive ourselves and our past actions, we'll never be fully used for God and his kingdom. We can get forgiveness from God, but Satan will beat us down unless we forgive ourselves. So I don't know if anybody needs to forgive our, you know, yourself for anything, but you need to turn it over to the Lord. See, not only that, we see he calls himself a servant. And I'm sure most of us, all of us, have really understood this term servant and the fact that in that day there was a time of servanthood that it wasn't we were going to another country and bringing people back and forcing them in labor. Most of the time over there, servanthood was they willingly gave themselves under into submission as a slave to either pay off a debt or to have protection, whatever the case is. There's various reasons. And when he's saying this, he's using the aspect of he's giving up his life in his will for the will of God. He's giving up his desires for God's will. And that's what we really need to look at. Are we really want to make a life and a name for ourselves or make our name in our life for God. You see, I have a little saying in here, God doesn't want employees, he's wanting servants. 
an employee can just quit and walk away. Employees are expecting this and that. Employees are expecting, you know, labor laws and things like that. God's not seeking employees. He's seeking servants. And if we understand the nature of the character of God, there's no greater master, king, and lord than Jesus Christ. So it should be nothing for us to be under the lordship of Jesus. And I know a lot of people within the free grace, they don't like the term lordship. Because a lot of times when we hear the term lordship, we think of lordship salvation. Hence why I wrote that book over there. Because we think you, some people teach you have to make Jesus the lord of your life and control every aspect of it, otherwise you're not a genuine believer. If you have your hand on the wheel and Jesus on there as well, unless you let go, that's not making him lord of your life, so you're not a genuine believer. So a lot of times, free grace folks, we don't like that term lordship. But it is a biblical concept. We have to make Jesus the Lord of our life, not for salvation, not for eternal security, but because of discipleship. Because he knows best how to live this life. And we have to take the role of servanthood to forsake our desires, our will, to seek, Lord, what is your will? Your will is going to be a different calling than what God calls for me. But you need to seek it. Will we be humble enough to bow under his lordship. You see, James, a half-brother of the Lord, calls himself not a brother, but a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else can we know from this first verse? He goes on to say, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So who are the audience? The audience is written right here. To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This is in reference, one of the reasons why Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum considers this a Messianic Jewish epistle because the audience is clearly Israel, the Messianic Jewish of Israel, of the 12 tribes. The fact that James is writing this letter to the 12 tribes of Israel reveals the fact that the myth of the lost tribes of Israel is false. Because when you're looking at the lost tribes of Israel, they'll say that during the Babylonian captivity or the Assyrian captivity, tribes were lost, tribal identities were lost, yada, yada, yada. They assimilated, whatever the case is. But here James knows the 12 tribes. He's addressing them right here. Then even still, even if they were lost to human people, we understand that in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, chapter 11, that God's going to call 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 12, from each tribe. So they're not lost. And so that just really throws that myth of the lost tribes away. So he's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel, which are scattered abroad. Scattered abroad really is the Greek diaspora. Diaspora, basically it's a compound word meaning a spread and forth of seed. It's used figuratively of like a farmer who's casting seeds to the ground, if you will. And that's where this Greek word really gets its idea from. Now, when we think of the Great Dispersion, we typically think of Acts, but the dispersion has happened numerous times within the Bible. It happened in Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity, happened here a couple times in the book of Acts. What I believe this is talking about, I believe this is talking about during the time of Acts chapter 8, when uh, Paul was wreaking havoc on the church, and they dispersed. Now, the thing about the diaspora, the scattering, the sowing of the seed, is the fact that that now this dispersion that happened, now the gospel is being going out to other areas instead of centralizing in Jerusalem. And so these are Jewish people, Messianic Jews, believers in the Messiah, Christians that were scattered. Basically, they were chased out, they were run out, they left their homes, they left their jobs, some left their family, uh, some were imprisoned, some were executed. There were times and periods of peace during these days, small peace, if you will. But a lot of times, a lot of these cities, if you read the book Acts, Jews were trying to find them and chase them out and persecute them. Peter got arrested, Paul got arrested, Silas got arrested. There's a lot of times of persecution. And so this letter is written by James to Christians. How do we know they're Christians? Fifteen times in this five-chapter letter, the word brethren is used. One, time, one thing. Three times the words beloved brethren are used. But the most clearest example for me is in James chapter 2, verse number 7, where he references, Do they not blaspheme you by that worthy name by which you are called? 
in allusion to Acts chapter 11, verse 26, where they were called Christians first at Antioch. There is a threefold way of telling these people are believers. So you have James, the half-brother of Jesus, that wrote the letter to the 12 tribes of Israel who are Jewish Christians that are under persecution. That's the backdrop. So when we're reading the letter, we got to remember times of persecution, Jewish Christians. Now the question is, if James wrote it, when did he write it? And why wasn't it the other, uh, the apostle James, James the Great? Well, the thing about the New Testament, the thing about Scripture is there's things known as chronological markers, ways we can date certain activities, events in the Bible. This is what the Book of Mormon does not have. This is what a lot of false religions do not have, but we do. There are ways we can figure out when certain things happen with the names of kings and activities, people within power. For instance, if James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this, he obviously had to write it before he died. We're, it's believed that he wrote it prior to A.D. 62, which is when it's believed he was martyred. So I don't think he would have wrote this post-mortem. And so A.D. 62 is probably the latest he would have written it. If it's written to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, it had to have been after a dispersion. I believe this is after Acts chapter 8, when Paul's wreaking havoc on the church. That is believed to have occurred around 34 A.D. So 34 A.D., 62 A.D. Act, James chapter 2, verse number 7, like I said, there's a reference to the worthy name by which you are called. I believe that's a strong evidence for being called Christians. We read in Acts chapter 11, verse number 26, that God records they were called Christians first in Antioch. And so if they were called Christians, that label first in Antioch, that happened around 42 A.D. So now we're looking at 42 to 62 A.D. Then we get to the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council was a big to-do because now a lot of Gentiles are getting into this faith. And now the, the Messianic Jews, they're like, okay, we keep all these traditions and laws. These people are coming in. What do we do? What do we do with Titus and Timothy and these others? And that's where James, after a lot of deliberation, said, okay, this is what we're going to ask of them, if you will. Nothing in the book of James hints at this mass incursion, if you will, of Gentiles. There's nothing real Gentile-y in this letter. Matter of fact, when we read in the beginning of chapter 2, in verse number, uh, where is it? Verse number 2, where it says, For if there come unto your assembly, many times in the Greek, the Greek word is ekklesia, which is the common word for assembly, you know, calling, whatever the case is. But in the Greek there, James actually used the word synagogue. And so it wasn't common to use ecclesia during the time James wrote this letter. That makes many people believe it had to have been before the Jerusalem Council of A.D. 50. And so you're looking at the dispersion of 42, the Council of 50, most likely somewhere in between there is when this letter was written. What was going on during that time? Well, in Acts chapter 12, Apostle James was beheaded. Paul, Peter was arrested and King Agrippa died. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. They preached in a couple cities and they were expelled from Antioch. Acts chapter 14, the healing happened in Lystra. Paul and Barnabas were deified. Claimed, uh, people claimed they were Mars and Jupiter. Paul was stoned, thought he was dead. And then there was a declaration that the church was going to go through many trials. Acts chapter 11, they were called Christians first in Antioch. Act chapter 15, when Jerusalem Council happened. In between those two date markers, there is a lot of persecution going on for being a Christian, for preaching. Again, with the backdrop of that, we have got to understand this letter. The final thing that we really need to figure out is what is the purpose of James? A lot of times when you're doing like a Bible book overview, you'll come across what people call a key verse, right? Key verse. That'll really be like a thesis statement for a paper or the main purpose statement, whatever the case is. The book of James is hard because many people are believing, and I would agree with this, that the book of James is written more like wisdom literature. And when I say that, I mean if you look at the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs is sort of like a bunch of bits of nuggets of truth and wisdom. 
Ecclesiastes, a bunch of nuggets of wisdom, right? James is sort of written like that as well, that it seems somewhat very disjointed. There's not a lot of uh, transitional clauses, things that link other areas together, saying because you did all this, do this type deal. It seems like it's somewhat sort of fra fragmented, sectioned off. That's why a lot of people think that the book of James is more of a wisdom literature, again, rejecting the idea that it's heavy in spiritual theology. This is a complete Christian uh, uh, living book. But there are a few key verses within. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, most famous, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's one key verse many people would look to. James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. That's another one. James 2, verse 20, but will you know, O oh man, that faith without works is dead. So we are looking at key verses. People will bring these up. James chapter 4, verse number 17. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, and James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. There's a lot of key verses in here. It doesn't really seem like there's one main thesis statement or one main purpose argument, if you will. So that's why I would agree this is more of a wisdom literature than it is sort of like Philippians or Corinthians or something like that. And because of that, it'll make it a little difficult to fully understand from our Western way of thinking. Because if you read the end of James, it's pretty abrupt. But let him that know, but let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a, save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Period. Dot. That's how James ends. Not like in the typical fashion of, you know, concluding remarks and recapping what was said or thanking certain people. So it really seems like that. But when I come to James and I look at, okay, what do I think with the backdrop, the audience, what's going on, reading it in its entirety, I think there's two purposes, really. And we're going to focus zero in on one. Number one, find joy in the trials of life. We have to be able to find joys in what we go through. James is no exception. We'll talk about him later next, next week. The second one is we have to have a, an active faith in the midst of trials and persecution. Through this letter, you will read that James is encouraging and rebuking Jewish Christians to not neglect the ministry that's around them because of what's happening to them. You look at Ukraine. You follow uh, uh, Kevin Smith over there in Ukraine. There's a lot of trials, persecution, trouble, things going on there. But they're not becoming... Uh, introverted. If anything, I, I didn't know them before, but they're probably a lot more outgoing and out, a lot more outreach oriented because they know time is of the essence. And that they're not letting their trials and sick circumstance close them in. They're having joy in it still and ministering to people that need a lot of ministry. But too many times we want to close up. I think those are the two main purposes and we're going to look at the second through this study. And then finally, he closes with greeting. It's just a customary greeting of the day. Many people believe that the word greeting alludes to the fact of because it's an infinitive, it's an infinitive mood, it's not a command. Infinitive simply means you can affix to or to be to the word. A lot of people say because the word greeting sort of has the idea of joy uh, or thriving. A lot of people have this thought that James is saying greeting or continue to be thriving, to be joyful to just encourage them to take joy in what they're doing in their ministry. Or it could just be a simple customary greeting of the day. All that's from the first verse of James. So again, a lot of times when we want to read over and gloss over introductory or closing you know, passages, there's so much information we can get out. The fact that James was such a humble person to swallow that pride pill. You see, if you've ever been to our house, you've probably seen our fish tanks. Right? We have six fish tanks in our house. In our living room, we have this massive 110-gallon tank with a bunch of colorful fish. I found a meme. Anybody ever seen uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok? Anybody seen? So, so you know the guy that, that, the bald guy that, you know, does the sword thing and whatever the thing is, right? And so he's showing these girls, like, he's like, look at all my stuff, right? He says, behold, my stuff. I got a meme. It, it, it's got that guy. He says, behold my fish tank. And it's got a picture of a fish tank there. I think it's kind of funny. It really applies. Anybody that comes to our house, since we've had it, we're like, hey, check out our fish tank, right? Sort of like, I need to charge fees now to just look at it. But the thing about fish, they're beautiful. 
African cichlids are the most beautiful freshwater fish money can buy. Okay, they're so colorful, the males, they color up, things like that. But they're also dumb. Fish are just dumb in general. The number one cause of fish death is overfeeding. It's not lack of water quality, it's stuff like It's overfeeding fish. Fish are so dumb that they're just going to keep eating. Even when they're full, they just keep eating, keep eating, keep eating. That's why if you go up to the fish tank, if you go to the fish tank in the office, they're going to act like they're starving. But fish can go a month without eating and be perfectly fine. But they kill themselves because they keep eating because fish owners keep feeding them, thinking they're hungry. Our fish are from Lake Malawi, so it's called Malawi bloat. One of the first signs is they'll get really full. They'll get really bloated. And so a lot of times fish can recover from that Malawi bloat. A lot of times they'll end up dying because they just eat too much. But when a fish gets Malawi bloat, you can recover and bring them back to health. But the next day, guess what? They're acting like they're starving again. They get all blowed up again. They got bloated again. And then you heal them again. Then they eat all over again, and they go through this cycle. They're not learning what they're being taught. You know, they're not applying the fact that if I eat too much, I'm getting bloated, and now I'm going to die. They're not applying what they're learning. I don't want us to read through the book of James just to figure out, hey, what James write about? I want us to go through the book of James to apply what we're learning. I don't want us to be like fish and get Malawi bloat because the thing with that is we're never going to be able to break through vicious cycles of lack of joy and trials, of closing in when we're going through obstacles. There are things in this word that unless we apply it to our life, we're not going to overcome it. So don't be like these fish that get healed and then go right back to it and forget everything. We have got to apply what we're learning. And with that, I always have some takeaways. And these are some things I want us to think about through the week. The first takeaway is realize that the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus extends to whosoever. James was that critical critic in the life of Jesus, but ended up sw swallowing his pride fill. And because of that, in his humility and his humbleness, Jesus elevated him to a position of leadership in the first mega church, if you will. Number two, just as James found forgiveness from Jesus, he had to have forgiven himself after years of rejecting him. If we don't forgive ourselves, we'll never be in the position to be elevated by God to be used for God in the call of God. And number three, although James was the half-brother of Jesus and may have been able to use his familial ties for gain, never in Scripture do we read that of Jesus. He doesn't call him the brother of Jesus, the brother of the Messiah, the brother of God. He places himself underneath Jesus and calls him Lord Jesus Christ. And so we must allow Jesus to be our Lord. We need to, with humility, place ourselves under the Lordship of Jesus Christ because God says those are the people he will raise up. And so if we're not being used of God, it may be because we're not, being, we're not placing ourselves under God. So those are the takeaways I want us to have for this week. Next week, we'll be in uh, uh, verse 2 and a few other verses. So read up, read ahead. Tonight was more of a one-way dialogue, if you will. But next week and, and here on after, it's going to be much more of a discussion. So with that, I just appreciate everybody's attent attentiveness. And uh, a reminder after this, we got the Stephen and Ari uh, send-off service. It's sad. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I don't cry. But, yeah, so that's back there. We're going to meet in here and then go back into Fellowship Hall. So with that, we'll pray, and then we'll be done for the evening. God, I thank you uh, just for your word. I thank you for the apostle or your half-brother of James. And, Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy for him, uh, to forgive him of rejecting you and being a critic. Lord, I also thank you for forgiving me for rejecting you all those years as well. So, God, I just pray that you would just allow us to take these things that we've spoken about and discussed this evening, apply it to our lives so that we don't get bloated as well, that we can learn and that we may grow and so that we can fulfill your will and your kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.